Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 16 on this uh, MOOCs course on the psychology of language. Up till now, we have covered a uh, lot of ground on to understanding what is language, what are its various factors, what is its nature and other uh, participants of the human language system. Today what we are going to do is we are going to look at two interesting facts in the human language. One is the writing system and the other is the reading system. Now, as you would have imagined, reading and writing is something which is not inherent or not uh, evolutionary in nature for humans because uh, our great great grandfathers never used to write nor they used to read. So, we will look at how the reading and writing systems developed in human language and what is the psychology behind those reading and writing systems. Now, before we uh, jump into understanding the psychology behind reading and writing, how this is done, what are the forms of it, how does the brain interpret and handle reading and writing, let us take a little bit of a journey back to where this course started, so that we have a context in which the present lecture is based. So, at the very beginning of the course, we started off by explaining what is language for that matter and what is communication. And to understand the difference between this language and communication, we focused on the basic form of communication which is the animal communication system. We looked at what a typical animal communication system would be like, what are its characteristics and why would animals communicate at all. We also looked at uh, some various basic forms of uh, the animal communication system, the models of animal communication system. For example, the call of the vervet monkeys or the, uh, the wiggle dance of the honey bee and we looked into detail of what these things are. Now, once we had an idea of what a basic communication system is like, we started focusing on to the more complex human language system which has its own rules, structure, the idea of how it is communicated and what does it mean. So, we looked into the structure, the, the principles of the human uh, language system next or the human uh, communication or language system next. Once we have looked at, did a comparison of the basic communication system in animals and the much developed human uh, language system, we went a little bit further and looked at the evolution of language, how did a language evolve. And there we looked at evidences which have been left to us. Uh, through generations of uh, uh, research which basically provide or which basically tells us how did language evolve. We looked at the idea of a language specific gene, we looked at the idea of how uh, there are social learning theories of languages and we also looked at some other fossil evidences of how language would have evolved. And lastly, we recounted or we uh, sort of found out what are the evidences that language is basically. Uh, uh, comes out of evolution. So, we are looking at those evidences which point towards this fact. Uh, we looked at the proto language, uh, the, uh, the use of pit gain and uh, the, the use of um, the human eye and all these structures um, and, and evidences which would explain how lang language have evolved through uh, eons and eons of uh, usage. So, how did the, uh, the basic language system come about and how does the modern language system come about? Now, once we had this idea of uh, the history of language and a little bit about what is the difference between hum the human and the animal com communication system, we focused ourselves on to looking at how research is done into language and so we looked at the scientific method of doing research in language. We looked at 
fact how uh, any language study is designed in, in terms of how to uh, decide the uh, the independent variables, the dependent variables, the kind of design that we should use in doing uh, language, whether it is a between subject or within subject design. We also looked at how does the scientific method actually proceeds from theory to observation and back to theory and how does induction and deduction play a role into this whole research cycle. Uh, further to it, we looked at behavioral techniques of uh, doing scientific research in language in terms of measuring latencies or reaction times and accuracies which indicate some idea of how languages are uh, built around or some interesting facts about languages. And lastly, we focused ourselves into the idea of how language is handled by the brain. So, a little bit uh, about how this kind of a study of language brain relation studies are done. And so, we then looked at those areas of the brain which are dedicated to understanding language for example, the Wernicke and uh, the Broca area and how these two areas the Wernicke and Broca area they interact with each other and how they form a common system for uh, language, the human language system. We also looked at some other uh, brain areas which are involved in language um, production, perception and, and so on so forth. We looked at some modern techniques where, like the EEG, the MRI, the fMRI and uh, other uh, the near infrared imaging, how these techniques actually help us in uh, conducting brain related studies on language. Now, once we had a good idea of how to do studies on language, scientific studies on language rather and what is the history of uh, the, the animal and human language system, the next part was to focus on the first aspect of language which was speech. Now, speech is a very basic form of language. So, we started off by looking at how this speech is perceived, how do we hear speech, the sound that we hear and uh, how do we make meaning out of sound when people utter it. So, uh, we started uh, by looking at the auditory perception, how does the auditory perception start? Uh, we looked at factors of how the wave is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, transmitting information and what it is composed of, what are basic frequencies, uh, what are overtones and what are the basic features of any uh, auditory perceptual system. We looked at the idea of uh, the human ear which is responsible for all the um, auditory perception which goes on. Next, we took a classic speech sound and we broke down uh, that speech sound in terms of the spectrograph and looked at uh, various characteristics of the speech sound. Uh, for example, what are forends, what are uh, 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 sorens, what are fricatives and those kinds of things which are special characteristics of the speech sound. Next, we focused ourselves on to the development of the speech perceptions. How does speech perception develop in children right from the idea of mother ease to baby talk and so on and so forth. And lastly, we looked at some theories of speech perception uh, basing ourselves into the auditory framework uh, of uh, speech perception to the motor theory and the direct realism theory. So, uh, in, in short, we covered up how speech is processed or how speech is uh, heard. Now, once uh, we are clear of how speech is heard, the other interesting obvious question was how speech is produced. And so, we dwell into the idea of how speech is produced in humans. So, we started doing a complete analysis of what the vocal tract looked like and how the production of speech happens from the vocal tract. So, all those factors are the, the anatomy of the vocal tract and how does it produce the speech sounds. Then we looked at the areas of the brain which are dedicated to hearing these uh, speech sounds and making meaning out of it. Uh, primarily again the uh, Wernicke and the Broca area and another connection between them uh, which makes us perceive the speech. The next thing that uh, we are interested in is looking at the models of speech perception, uh, the feed uh, the feed forward feedback model and uh, some other models of uh, speech perception. For example, the DIVA model which is a computational model, the dual stream model and so on and so forth. And lastly, we looked at how the development of speech production happens in uh, smaller children or how smaller children understand this uh, the, the idea of producing speech. We focused a little bit on how babbling helps in speech production and then we looked at uh, theories of social aspects of babbling um, and we also looked at speech disorders which gave us some idea of how speech is produced in smaller children and how they smaller children learn to produce speech. Now, once we uh, were able to handle speech sounds, the 
primary ingredient of any speech sound are words. If you look at how the human language, at least the English language is structured, it starts off with the phonemes which is a basic speech sound and add these phonemes together to form something called the morphemes which is the simplest uh, word or, or the simplest unit of um, uh, speech uh, which um, has some kind of a meaning. And one good example of a morpheme is the end word ending or the tense markers and so on and so forth. These morphemes combine together to form something called words which are the central point or which are the cent central unit. Uh, which is used by humans for exchanging ideas. So, words are those units which have a symbol and which have a pronunciation. So, the next question that we were looking for is what are words basically. So, we looked at the anatomy of a words, what does word really mean? We looked at the kind of word which is available for example, the content and the function words, the idea that words have a pronunciation as well as a symbol and uh, those kind of things. Then we looked at how we learn words. So, how does word learning uh, basically take place in, in human? We looked at the, uh, the speed at which word learning happens and we pointed out some curves. For example, the uh, idea that uh, by, the, by the sixth or eighth week uh, of, of birth, the children uh, by si sorry, so the six years of birth, the children start learning very fast and there is a drop after that. So, initially the ch children do not learn words, but then there is a sprout of learning and this is called the uh, on the curve learning. And so, we looked at how this these things happen. We also looked at how mapping and uh, uh, neighborhood uh, words and other factors help in learning of words. The next interesting thing was once a child has learned a word, how does he retrieve it back? How do humans retrieve words back and that was what we were focusing on. So, we looked at how word learning happens both through the phonological form and the using of the mental lexicon and how these two processes combine together to uh, help us learn word. We looked at cortical organizations of how words are stored into the uh, 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 into the mental lexicon. And the last thing that we uh, looked at is uh, how words are retrieved. So, we looked at where they are stored, uh, that was the third section where how they are stored and where they are stored in the mental lexicon, how the mental lexicon is made and the last is how the word retrieval happens. And we looked at several models of word retrieval, for example, the spoken uh, word recognition model, uh, the word production model, the leaflet feed forward feedback model and the Dale interactive model which gave us an idea of how words are stored words are retrieved from the mental lexicon. The next thing was that words in itself have no meaning or they are not part of a conversation. So, single words never make conversation and so these words are arranged into sentences which make conversation. So, the next step was understanding what are sentences. So, we looked at the structure of any sentence, how does the sentence uh, is structured and what each words and how words are arranged in a sentence and what they mean and how they mean. Then we looked at how the process of comprehending a sentence actually takes place. We looked at how sentences are produced, so the various um, uh, factors which help us in producing sentences and lastly we looked at uh, the learning the syntactic structure. So, how do children learn the syntactic structures of sentences? Syntactic structure means that the rules through which sentences are formed and what is a legal sentence and what is not a legal sentences. So, how do children learn these factors? Obviously, once we have sentences with us, we are able to communicate and so this communication that happens between people is called a discourse. Now, this discourse are two forms, one is called the narrative and the other is called uh, the conversation. So, uh, in a conversation, uh, the, uh, many people talk at the same time and they exchange ideas. In narrative, one person speaks and the other person actually looks at it. So, we started looking at what is conversation and what are the basic uh, factors and conversation, what principles, nature of a conversation and so on and so forth. Then we moved um, into narratives and how does narratives uh, work. So, conversation, narratives, two forms of discourse, how do they work. We then moved on to something called anaphora and inferences. So, anaphora is basically replacement of a certain words, for example, using pronounces uh, idea of a anaphora. And lastly, we looked at how does discourse ability develop in children. So, how do children learn to uh, do the discourse or talk? And that makes us uh, come to the idea of how reading and writing happens. Now, as uh, I have mentioned before, this reading and writing is something which was not uh, built in in the human system. And so, uh, evolutionary uh, in the evolutionary cycle, reading and writing was not there. It is only through past uh, 5000 years or so that this reading and writing systems actually developed. So, then there are no dedicated systems in the brain 
to read and write to help us in reading and writing. So, first we will look at the in today's uh, section we will look at the writing systems and then we will look at the uh, reading systems. So, how, how do we develop this idea of reading or how do we develop this skill of reading? So, certain brain areas are trained uh, or they are rehashed into reading and writing and that is one reason why there are so many people who are dyslexic, they are not able to either read or write and they struggle with reading and writing. The reason being that there is no dedicated area and there is no training system for the brain to read and write. And so, what happens is perceptual systems or perceptual uh, networks in the brain are used for uh, are retained for uh, uh, writing and, and comprehending writing and similarly these, the, these are the same areas which are also trained for reading. So, uh, basically then uh, what really happens is uh, this learning is really hard. As, as you can find the smaller children when they go to school, they have a lot of problem in learning uh, to read and write. The reason being that most systems, most forms of writings are different, right. And so, if most forms of writing are different, then it is very difficult to understand uh, uh, how does this ability generally develop. But we as humans have this idea of developing this writing system or uh, we uh, can develop this writing system uh, very well. So, let us look at how did the writing systems in the world actually uh, start about and so the full fledged writing system actually uh, evolved from the calendars and tally sheets which merchants uh, and and, uh, and uh, people doing businesses and commercial transactions in the world uh, they they develop this idea of writing now in the beginning, uh, the humans were hunter gatherers and they had no reason for reading and writing. But as the agrarian society developed and, and these hunter gatherers they started uh, living in close circles, they, they had to develop an idea of to keep upon, uh, counting of what they have. And so, from these calendars and tally sheets and these um, uh, uh, meaning of accounting or developing a system to account for things. Uh, the whole writing system evolved. Now, civilizations in the Middle East, uh, they keep written records for some 5000 years ago. So, so they believe that Middle East uh, systems, uh, uh, writing system starts some 5000 uh, years ago. But historians debate that Chinese came up with the idea of writing far, far uh, ahead of the um, uh, Middle Eastern people. Now, if you look at how the society has developed in the past, uh, in the recent past, you would have seen that reading and writing was something which was dedicated to only a few chosen people in the society, which were the priests and the bureaucrats. And so, this reading and writing system also did not popularize. Only with the revolution that happened, the industrial revolution that happened, the revolution that happened in this in the world in the uh, last uh, uh, maybe 10 decades, this this reading and writing actually reached to masses. Before that, it was some specific groups of people that were uh, looking at reading and writing. So, basically all writings in this world uh, can be uh, grouped into three basic forms and that is what I have here. So, main writing systems in the world can be grouped into three forms. This is the system, this is the unit of the symbol and this is an example. So, the first form of writing system is in terms of making symbols. So, example this is one symbol, this is a Chinese symbol for a man and this is the Chinese symbol for a woman. So, the first form of writing system was the, lo uh, the logographic system which came from simple structures or simple symbols that people made and these symbols actually represented words and morphemes. And an example of this systems are Chinese uh, which is the, uh, the most proponent uh, user of or the most progressive user of this system. So, what then is uh, the uh, logogram actually means? A logogram basically is a written system that represents a word or a morpheme. So, basically a, a logogram is, is a system and these pictures that you have. So, it is believed that earlier uh, earlier our uh, ancestors also, they use this kind of symbols to write because there is no writing systems developed. And so, these systems were carried out by Chinese and these and if you look at the Chinese writing system, they use these symbols. So, these symbols basically are called the logograms. And what is this logogram or this logographic style of writing? The logograms actually mostly represents a word or a morpheme. It sometimes it represents a word or sometimes it represents a uh, part of a word or a part of a sounds together to uh, mean a morpheme or, a, uh, or, or, or not a complete word sometimes a partial word also and a good example of Chinese. 
a good example is that. The other form of writing system which has developed in the world is called the syllabary form of uh, writing system and what is the syllabary form of writing system? Here sentences or certain syllables are used. So, uh, uh, these logographs are combined together to form certain syllables and these syllables actually develop the, uh, the whole uh, writing system. And so, in, in, in terms of the syllabary system, the unit of uh, the syllable is the unit of uh, symbol is the syllable and a good example is the Japanese. Now, what, what the Japanese found out is that when they used Chinese, Chinese was difficult uh, uh, thing to understand. There were so many words and there were so many pictographs to learn. So, what the Japanese did was they reinvented this Chinese uh, uh, diagram and uh, Chinese uh, lithographic symbols and they uh, chose some 40 uh, out, out of these uh, number of uh, uh, Chinese symbols to, uh, uh, to make a list of uh, syllables which have some meaning in Japanese. And so, that is why the Japanese is a modification of the Chinese and so, they use the syllabary system uh, which is uh, another writing system. And the third form of writing system is called the alphabet in which the phoneme is used, the speech sound is used, the unit of symbol is the basic speech sound and it is uh, simply uh, examples are Greek or the Korean. So, first form, some, uh, uh, first form of the writing system is the logographic in which the pictures uh, or the symbols are used. In the second form and these symbols actually mean the word or the, uh, the morpheme. So, the symbols actually mean the word or the morpheme. So, it is a higher level uh, the understanding or it is a higher level unit of language. In the syllabary form of writing system, it is the syllable. So, it is again more higher uh, than the alphabet system. So, syllabary system, in the syllabary system the basic unit is the syllable. So, we start with syllable and that uh, syllables combined together from the word and the writing system which is then an example is the Japanese. In the alphabet form, the basic system is the speech sound and so these speech sound they combine together to form the morphemes and they, they form the, uh, these morphemes form the syllables and then the words and so on and so forth. And so, it is a more uh, dedicated system or a more extensive system, the alphabet and the basic unit sound is the uh, phoneme and the examples of this are the Greek and the Korean. So, let us look at some of the writing systems uh, of the world. So, we have the logographic system. The logographic system here the symbols are logograms each representing a word or a symbol. In the, in the logograph as I said the words are represented as a word or a uh, uh, symbol. Now, the early Middle Eastern and Central American scripts were logographic and the Chinese still use these kind of logographic scripts. Uh, scripts. Now, logographic uh, uh, script they require us to understand thousands of logograms one for each morpheme in a language and so it is very difficult it's, it's understanding Chinese or learning Chinese, writing Chinese is difficult. Also the problem came up where uh, Chinese systems borrowed word from other systems or Chinese writing system borrowed word from other languages. So, foreign names and loan, uh, loan words they posed a particular kind of problem for logographic systems and the general solution was to use logograms for their pronunciation value only. And so, later on these logograms were not, not used for meaning a word or meaning a uh, morpheme, they generally were in a, in a later development the logographs or the symbols were used for the phonetic value only or the pronunciation value only. Now, uh, all writing systems started off logographically as you, as you know that most writing systems started with symbol, uh, these kind of symbols if you look at uh, the, uh, the ancient Asian civilization, the Mediterranean system, the Egyptian system, any other system for that matter, the Vedic scriptures, all of them mostly they have this kind of a symbols which represents things, the sun, the moon, most examples like that and so they are logographic. So, most writing systems start with logographic and Chinese writing systems is uh, still logographic in nature. Now, sometimes logograms are used for phonetic values only to represent foreign words. And so, uh, there are times the modern usage of log logograph is in terms of the uh, usage not in terms of words and uh, morphemes or word endings, it is in terms of only the phonetic value or in terms of the, uh, the speech value, the pronunciation value. So, uh, the practice of using Jap, uh, the logographs from the Chinese they borrowed to uh, uh, by the Japanese and they 
made this logographic system, uh, they produced this logographic system into a uh, logical conclusion. Now, at first educated Japanese uh, simply wrote Chinese where they wanted to compose a text. Uh, but this situation was similar to the medieval European scholars who wrote Latin even though it was in their mother tongue. Now, in the, be in the beginning there seems to have been a psychological connection between the script and the language and it was in the later generations that show how the foreign script could be used to make their own language. Now, over time what the Ch Japanese did was they began using Chinese characters to uh, represent J Japanese words. So, the, what they did what they used they borrowed the Chinese characters and they started um, uh, making words, Japanese words or making Japanese words from the Chinese words. But then what happens is many words and morphemes in Japanese were not exactly matching or were not uh, had did not have equivalent logographic characters in the uh, Chinese. So, what the Japanese then did was uh, they agreed on a set of 50 uh, symbols that could stand for all possible symbols of the language. Thus, uh, in Japan the Chinese logographic system they evolved into a native syllabary system which is a writing system which represents each syllable with a different uh, symbol. And so, that is where the syllabary system is the best example is Japanese. So, what they did was they found out that uh, most Chinese uh, logographs were not equivalent to uh, the Japanese words. And so, what they did was they, they borrowed some 50 uh, different uh, logographs which could um, stand for all possible syllables of the particular language in Japanese and this is called the syllabary system. Now, these symbols uh, characters are simplified to the point that they bear little resemblance to the original logogram. So, they simplified these 50 logographs that they borrowed from uh, the Chinese, the Japanese borrowed from the Chinese and they, ma they made sure that these mean all the or these comp uh, comprised of these the combination of these would mean all the, uh, the syllables in Japanese. And so, they, they, they uh, made this so easy or they simplified it so easy that the original resemblance to the Ch Chinese character was not there anymore. So, each symbol in a syllabary each symbol represents a syllable and Japanese syllabary evolved from use of Chinese logographs for its phonetic value. Now, in, in Japan in fact, there are two uh, ver, uh, versions of uh, uh, writing system. One is uh, the favored angular style which is called the uh, uh, katakana which is uh, an angular style of writing and then we, we have uh, the old form of writing uh, the Japanese uh, system which is the Bodhik monk would have preferred and this is called the hiragana style. Nowadays both of them are combined together the hiragana and katakana are combined together to, uh, uh, to write the Japanese system. Now, another uh, form of uh, writing system is called the alphabet here each symbol represents a phoneme. Now, as you saw in the logographic system the, uh, the logograph or the symbol would mean a word or a word ending. In the syllabary system each uh, symbol would mean a syllable, but in uh, in the alphabet the symbol each symbol that we have actually means a phoneme. Now, ancient Greeks were first to invent alphabets, Koreans independently invented own alphabet centuries later. Now, Initially, uh, it was the Greeks, uh, the ancient Greeks who invented the alphabet and the Koreans they took this alphabet and they simplified this thing together. So, alphabet is a writing system that represents each phoneme uh, with a different symbol. Now, the Roman alphabet which the English people use uh, and uh, is the English people use and the Cyrillic alphabet which the Russians use are descendant of the Greek alphabet. So, both the Russian language the Russian alphabet and the English alphabet are coming from the same Greek thing. So, Roman English and Cyrillic Russians evolved from ancient Greek language. Now, let us have a quick look at some writing system. So, it is a sample of a written English sentence equivalent to several other languages. You have a sentence although humans have been speaking since the beginning of the uh, species uh, writing is a fairly recent invention and you can see this in Chinese. So, there are certain uh, logograms here the Japanese, this is the Korean form, the Arabic, the Bengali, the Armenian, Greek, Gujarati, Hebrew, Hindi, Canada, Russian, Tamil and Thai. And so, as you can see that these languages have their own symbol for representing each word uh, in, in either a word or a syllable or a phoneme and that is how they work. In English you would see that the writing system use the phonological interpretations whereas, in the Chinese system each these words each of these words each of these symbols actually represents either a morpheme or a, uh, a word in its uh, 
form and similar to that there are other writing systems they have their own descriptors or they have their own method of encoding this. Now, another interesting thing to look at in terms of writing system is something called the orthography. So, what is orthography then? Or orthography is a set of rules which are uh, uh, for writing a word of a language. So, those rules which you use for writing the words of a language is actually uh, called the orthography. Now, uh, the Roman alphabet uh, mostly wide used writing systems around the world. The Ro Roman alphabet is the most widely used writing system around the world. Roman alphabet to write English is not actually a good fit. If you look at the way the Roman, we borrow the Roman alphabet, English borrows the Roman alphabet for writing English. And so, what happens is the Roman alphabet is actually not a good fit for writing English. The reason being that the in uh, the Roman alphabet which is basically the Latin, it has only two dozen of phonemes. Whereas, two dozen basic speech sound. Whereas, when you look at English, the English has 40 different phonemes and so here it comes the problem. The problem is that for accommodating 40 phonemes out of only 12 phonemes in the initial Latin, what we have to do is we have to come up with something called combined phonemes or complex phonemes. And so, these kind of combined phonemes uh, for example, the ch sound, the ch sound or the sh sound which are phonemes in English, they use two phonemes from the ancient Latin. Now, spoken English has undergone a number of major shifts uh, over the last few centuries, but its spelling has remained uh, virtually unchanged with the result that there is often a confusion or a mismatch between the uh, spoken and the written forms in English. Now, what are uh, so Roman alphabets mostly widely used in writing system in the world, most European languages, uh, many uh, non-European languages have adopted this form of writing system. So, how did this uh, Roman alphabet uh, actually or the, the in the uh, became the most prominent form of writing system? Now, initially uh, people were not using the Roman alphabet, but with the development of computers and uh, uh, devices, the uh, net connecting devices, we have to use a keyboard which is called the QWERT keyboard. And so, the QWERT keyboard, they uh, uh, they are standard worldwide and so they pushed the QWERT form of writing systems around the world or more people started using this form of writing. Even if you want to type German or Russian, you would have to use the QWERT keyboard and from there you have to make some uh, keystrokes. These keystrokes will be interpreted by the computer to the original language. For example, writing French or writing uh, the, the Spanish, uh, this the idea is that the keyboard will always be in the QWERT format and so you have to use the QWERT format and so the use of the QWERT uh, keyboard actually made a push to the use of uh, the Roman alphabet. It is not actually good for English spelling does not match with the pronunciation and so as I said the, the idea is that English is not a good match for the Latin. The reason being the Latin has only limited number of phonemes, English has more than that and that is one reason the way of uh, 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 spelling is pronounced or there is a difference between the spelling of a word and the actual word in itself. So, uh, that is basically what is called orthography. So, orthography is a set of rules for writing the uh, words of a language. Now, English orthography is complex, uh, but Spanish uh, are easy. Now, the situation in which spelling and pronunciation are closely matched are called shallow orthography and the situation in which the pronunciations are poorly matched is called deep orthography. So, we have two kinds of orthography basically the uh, languages in which what you spell and what you write for example, in Hindi what you spell is what you write and so in Hindi is a shallow shallography uh, orthography, uh, but uh, there are languages for example, English or uh, you have more complex uh, uh, systems in the world Chinese in which what you speak and what the spellings are, it is very difficult to make a correlation between them and so uh, those are said to have the deep orthography. So, shallow orthography spellings and pronunciation closely match for example, Spanish and German. If you write hund, if I say the word hund, what you are going to write is hunda and this is how the spelling of hund which is the dog in German and uh, similarly in Spanish. But look at spellings and pronunciation poorly matched in English. For example, I, I wish to write uh, let us say psychology. So, the pronunciation will be psychology this should be how it should be written, but we all know the spelling of psychology is this and that is why it has a deep orthography because technically it should start with S, but it is starting with P. The idea that certain words are silent, certain letters are silent, all these makes English a uh, word with a deep orthography. 
Now, we can think of shallow and deep orthography as the two ends of a continuum. Uh, Korean is the best form of a language which has the shallowest orthography. So, what Koreans actually did was uh, they intentionally invent, invented an alphabet which is called the Hangul with, and this uh, uh, in this Hangul language uh, you precisely write what you speak and so it is the easiest form of language system to uh, learn. Now, so how does the, the, the deep and shallow orthography words they differ with each other? One way to look at one way shallow and deep orthographic differs is how they treat with uh, how they treat the something called the homophones. So, what are homophones? These are words with the same pronunciation, but different meanings. So, how the homophones are dealt uh, will tell you a little bit about how the shallow and deep orthography they differ. So, what are homophones? These are words with the same pronunciation, but different meaning. Look at the word sound. Now, if you look at sound of music, here the way the sound is expressed or the meaning of sound, safe and sound and the meaning of sound here and puget sound the meaning of sound here are three different things. Here sound of music is the sound that we are actually talking about, safe and sound means wellness in terms of it and puget sound is the running water sound, uh, The it, it puget sound means a body of water a water body right and so three different things this is about wellness and this is about sound in the actual meaning. So, the same word sound when used with three different contexts would mean three different things and this is what is called the homophone. So, the same sound is meaning different and this is the how we deal with this homophone is uh, uh, telling us a lot about how the deep L shallow orthography could be different. Also, homophones may also be spelled differently. Look at two, two, and two. Now, homophones, if, if I just say two, I am giving it to you, or uh, he is too sweet to do something, or it is give me two. In all the cases, I am speaking two, but the spelling of two is varying. Similarly, with four, four, and four, and there, there, and there. And if you look into it, the words are spelled the same, but they are written differently, and that is why English has a difficult or a deep orthography. So, basically in speech we have to rely on the context to define the meaning of sound was intended and this is likewise the case when the orthography is shallow uh, it, it, it is the word sound, but many homophones in English are spelled differently. For example, uh, we have 222 and 444. Now, multiple spellings of a homophone pose no particular problem when reading them, but they do when writing them. And even your humble, so uh, basically that is the kind of uh, uh, difficulty that we have. Now, more troublesome for readers are something called homographs. So, one way of differentiating shallow and deep orthography is the homophone. Another way of read, uh, differentiating between shallow and deep orthography is the treatment of something called the homographs. So, what are homographs? Uh, these are words that are spelled the same, but they are pronounced differently. Uh, for example, the word, so words which are same spelled, but differently pronunciation and have different meaning. These are called the homographs. For example, read and read, read and read. They are spelled similarly, but they are pronounced differently and they have meaning. Or example, heed. So, if we look at lead and heed and read and uh, so, uh, heed or heed or lead. or read, they are rhyming words, but then they are spelled similarly, but then they have different spelled the same, but pronounced differently. At the deep end of orthography is the Chinese language. It is often thought at least in the uh, West that each Chinese logogram is an arbitrary symbol. But, it, uh, but if that was true, few people would have learned 5000 plus characteristics of Chinese. Uh, so, there are a couple of hundred basic characters which are common in Chinese and uh, which make a simplest uh, way of which makes us the idea of simple uh, form of learning Chinese. So, the differentiation between shallow and uh, uh, deep orthography could be done in terms of homophones on the idea of homographs. So, basically then. Uh, uh, 
whether a language has a deep or a shallow orthography uh, has more to do with its historical and social factors. So, basically the idea that whether it is a shallow orthography or deep orthography has to do with its societal factors or the fact that where the language is coming from and that is how it is. Now, how does the brain then understand letters? So, the brain as a letter box. Now, brain as I said was not hardwired for reading at all. The writing systems may represent language at the world uh, at the word syllable or phoneme language but there are alike in uh, terms of symbols that they use. So, most uh, writing systems, uh, they the these writing systems may be based at the level of the word or these writing system may be based at the level of syllable or phoneme. As we saw, it could be a logographic system or it could be a, a syllabary system or it could be a alphabet system, but they have to be alike. How they are alike? Because they use symbols, they use the same symbols for writing. So, all writing systems consist of characters that are composed of lines and curves in contrasting or uh, orientations. So, even if I write P which is an um or uh, uh, which is an alphabet and, and or, or if, if I write uh, this which is um, a logograph or any other uh, form this is a syllable. Uh, so, if you if you look into it all of these are symbols and so the use of symbols is what is common in most languages in the world. And what are these symbols? These are characters that are composed of lines and curves in a particular orientation. Uh, in, uh, so, letters are line drawings basically most letters that is used in languages in writing systems are line drawings and this is true whether the language is written with a stylus or a clay tablet or a pen or a other writing instrument and so on and so forth. Now, as the brain is not higher uh, hardwired for reading. Uh, writing systems must conform to the way the brain processes visual information. And so, uh, if we read a written statement or if we read something which is written, the brain has to understand how to process this symbol and for that we have to depend upon how the perceptual system of the brain actually works. Now, the primary visual cortex is in the occipital uh, lobe at the back of the head An early process in visual perception. Uh, is the edge detection and, and it is uh, one of the brain's first step in distinguishing various objects in the visual array. Now, this is why line drawings are often easier to interpret than photographs. They highlight the edges of an object so that the brain does not have to. Thus, the brain first interprets any letter as visual and not in linguistic object. So, whatever you write, the first thing that the brain actually does is understand the form in which it is written. The reason is that the brain first interprets any letter which is written and how does it read it? It interprets this letter in terms of its symbols, in terms of what is written out of it and in terms of its edges and curves and so on and so forth and later on the process of processing only the linguistic form is uh, added to it. Now, brain also needs a place to store this information about the writing system is learned and, and this is at the boundary. So, where does the brain store these writing systems where the comparison uh, of the the written material which have which you have in front of it is done it is in the boundary between the inferior temporal lobe and the occipital lobe and this region is called the fusiform gyrus so basically the writing system must conform to the way the brain processes visual information edge detection is the early visual process and writing as line drawing. So, as I said most writing systems have a symbol whether it is at the word level, it is at the syllable level or it is at the uh, phone level or phoneme level, uh, they have to have a symbol. So, we have to understand how the brain interprets this symbol and that will give us how writing systems or reading systems actually develop. And so, the one way of understanding this is edge detection which is the primary form of um, uh, brain understanding the language. Now, visual word forms from the area. So, between occipital and the temporal lobe you have this area which is called the fusiform gyrus. This is is where the uh, storage of symbols of the writing system are done regardless of the type of script which is being used. Now, visual processing of written words uh, the same whether the alphabet is syllabary or the uh, logographic in information. So, basically what it means is that the visual word form area is the area which stores all the symbols whether it is coming from a logographic uh, written system or it is coming from any other system for that matter. So, uh, 
how does the brain then understand this writing? So, because initially the brain was uh, had developed area for processing visual images, forms. So, how did this develop? How did uh, the brain master this idea of storing the symbols and, and interpreting meaning out of the symbol uh, and, and, and reading that symbol? So, that happens through something called the neuronal re recycling hypothesis. What does it uh, really mean? So, it is not uh, clear why human beings uh, were doing with a visual word form area to hundreds and thousands of years. Now, perhaps our hunter gatherer ancestors used this portion of the brain for reading animal tracks and, uh, and uh, distinguishing edible form of inedible plant. Now, the recruitment of special brain areas uh, for the use of visual word form uh, area is generally called the neuronal recycling hypothesis, which is a proposal that the brain uh, areas designed for one function can be recognized to perform another function which is similar in, uh, uh, in function. So, brain areas designed for one function can be reorganized and so this is how the occipital lobe or the fusiform uh, area, uh, uh, these areas are recruited by the brain for understanding the symbols which is written in, in, in text form and uh, perceiving the symbols and later on extracting meaning out of this, uh, meaning out of the symbol and uh, generating conversation out of it. So, perform another somewhat similar function. So, this is called the neuronal recycling hypothesis and this is the how the brain actually uh, understands writing systems or understand written material and uh, reads it. So, another interesting thing that I promise is we will look at how reading happens. So, uh, we generally believe that when we read, we read in a we read in a very smooth manner and most reading they happen in uh, through something called eye movements. So, most reading happens through eye movements, there are two kinds of movements, one is called the circad and the other is called the fixation. So, uh, fixation is when your eye focuses on certain letters and circad is the uh, jump that the eye does. Now, uh, basically Basically speaking, uh, as the eyes move along a line of text or a series of circads and fixation happens, uh, now a circad is a rapid movement of an eye from one fixation point uh, to another, while fixation is a period of time when the eye remains stationary. The average duration of fixation is about 200 uh, uh, milliseconds, but it can vary depending on a number of other factors. And the way uh, the brain processes visual input during fixation and ignores it during circards. Now, it is believed that skill readers, uh, the targets of circard is a point just left to the center of uh, the, the next fixated word. Now, beginning readers, uh, they tend to fixate all words at the same time, whereas uh, skilled readers they do not do that, they only fixate on certain words. And if you do not believe me, you will find out that. Uh, if you, if you uh, if I give you this task, you'll find out that this is what actually happens. In the beginning, or beginning readers actually fixate on all words, but as you progress, you start not fixing on the functional word, but only fixing on the content word. Now, if you, if I give you this task to count the Fs, uh, which are there in this sentence, finished files are the result of years of uh, scientific study combined with the experience of, of many years. Now, if I ask you to count the number of Fs, it is very much possible that you will count the number of Fs, the count that you have will be less. And this is because your eyes are, since you have a skill reader, your eyes are not fixating on the function words, for example, of, of, uh, this kind of words of this kind of words you are not fixing and so you will have the number of f's but you will only have the number of f's for these kind of words which are called the content word and this effect is called the missing letter effect. Now, skill readers uh, skip over predictable words and thus cannot track the letters in those words. Now, the amount of information that can be taken in during one fixation is limited by the structure of the retina at the back of the eye. Now, the fovea is the region which is directly uh, which is directly behind the pupil where the vision is most acute. The area surrounding the fovea where the vision is less accurate is called the paraphovea and is uh, clearly discerns only letters that fall in the fovea and in the range of the letters. Uh, that can be processed during fixation is known as the perceptual span. So, most reading happens in terms of the eye movement. Now, the eye movement is generally concerned on a region of the uh, retina which is called the fovea which is the region of the retina directly behind the pupil, pupil where most vision is accurate. So, region, there is a region in the eye on the retina where most focusing happens and this is called the fovea. Now, there is another region which is called the paraphovea and so what is this? This is the area surrounding the fovea where the vision is less accurate and so reading happens in terms of this fovea paraphovea kind of 
uh, structure where so each sentences or each symbols uh, become the center of uh, 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 center of perception. Now, perceptual uh, span, perceptual span is the let, uh, range of letters that can be processed during one fixation. Now, in skill readers, the perceptual scan is generally lopsided. If you are a good skill reader, your perceptual span will be lopsided, extending extremely 15 characteristics uh, characters to the right of the fixation sound, uh, fixation point, and about four characters to the left of it. Perceptual scan can decrease as the reading materials becomes more and more complex, and likewise, beginning readers or readers with dyslexia have lower perceptual spans. Now, the perceptual span is measured by something called the gaze uh, contingency paradigm, which measures the perceptual span. What happens is you present a narrow window of text surrounding the fixation point. And so, uh, based on this narrow window of text surrounding the fixation point, how many words are you able to process will give you your gaze con uh, the gaze span. This is how the perceptual span happens. Only a few letters are fully discernible at the fixation point. Your perception is a complete register of text that is an illusion created by the brain and it reconstructs text from memory. Now, if this is the fixation point 4, this is what happens. So, you have 15 letters to this side and 4 letters to this side. The gaze contingency paradigm, um, what does it mean? Uh, uh, the display window is determined by feedback from eye tracking this device. So, how much time the display is has to be uh, uh, has to be presented is de uh, determined by the eye tracking device and changes with circuits to the new fixation point. While the rest of the letters in the text are replaced by X. Now, since the peripheral image is blurred, participants in these experiments generally don't notice uh, the rest of the text as they are masked and the only portion that they are currently looking is displayed. Now, varying the length of uh, the width of the display window, the participants perceptual can be, can be measured. So, span is how much can you read and so this is a good example of perceptual scan. This is the gaze paradigm, gaze contingency paradigm by restricting how much text is available on either side of the fixated window, researchers can test hypothesis about how much information is extracted from the paraphyseal vision. Now, fovea is the region where most perception happens, but the region uh, surrounding this fovea is called the paraphoveal region and there are text here. Now, it is believed that 15 characters uh, to the right and 4 characters to the left is what skilled readers would process, but then this span can be tested by using a paradigm like this. Now, fixation duration is influenced by a number of factors. For example, frequency effect, low frequency words fixate longer than high frequency word. So, how much you fixate, how much time do you fixate on a word, it depends upon something called whether the word is a low frequency word or a high frequency word. Similarly, you have something called predictable effect, less predictable words are fixated longer than more predictable words. The more you uh, know a word, the more predictable a word is, the lower the fixation of that word will be and uh, uh, the higher the, pred uh, the less predictable a word is, the higher fixation you will have for that word, the higher predictable a word is, the lower fixation you are going to have for that particular word. There is also something called the spillover effect. Uh, which is which is what uh, the spillover effect is the processing difficulties of preceding word fixation duration of the current word is extended. Now, if the word that you are presently processing it is it was uh, uh, followed before or it had a word which was difficult to process what would happen is a spillover effect. So, the processing time of the next word even if it is an easy word will be longer the reason is that the, the last word that you are processing it was difficult or it was it has it has uh, it had a difficult processing and so the the time would add up onto the current word and this is called the spillover effect. And we also have something called the paraphobia and fovea effect. The characteristics of the following word affect duration of the current word. Uh, this is a case in which characteristics of the following word affect the fixation duration of the current word. Now, because of the following word in the paraphobia, while the current word is in the fovea, this is known as the paraphobia and fovea effect. More specifically, when the word is in the paraphobia, uh, which rem which remember cannot cannot be seen clearly. You can remember that, but you cannot be it cannot be seen is high in frequency or predictability. It can shorten the fixation duration of the current word. So this is basically what is called the paraphobia or fovea effects. Now, what are the models of reading? The the one model of reading is called the dual root model of reading. And so, what does it model uh, believe? Now, there are several models which have been proposed. 
uh, of how we go from written word form to retrieving the words meaning from memory. Uh, the model differ in detail in the mechanisms that they product the predictions they make and they agree uh, that there are two routes for processing written words. Now, if you look at word processing and we looked at word processing in, in uh, uh, the fifth lecture, we looked at there are there is something called a dual root model of word fixation or uh, word processing and uh, these dual root is me meaning versus pronunciation. Now, the dual root model makes the proposal that readers can can either first access a word's meaning and then its pronunciation or else first access a word's pronunciation and then its meaning. This is called the dual form model. Now, skilled researchers have two ways of accessing meaning of a written word, re direct root written word meaning, indirect root written word spoken form and then meaning. Spoken form is called the pronunciation. So, there are two words, one is the direct root, the other is the uh, indirect root. Now, the two uh, dual model can be thought of as different strategies for reading. When we read words that are very familiar such as uh, is the word is or the word of or when you encounter irregular words, when we encounter irregular words such as yacht and colonel, uh, we use the direct root of processing because here the words are uh, easy to learn. Now, only after a word's meaning is accessed does the pronunciation of these words being accessible. So, those words which you are familiar of where the word's meaning is first accessed and then the pronunciation is accessed. On the other hand, when we encounter a word we do not we don't know such as the pseudo word articulate. Articulate is a, a pseudo word that I have created and it may uh, seem like a word. So, the word is entry succulate. This is any word you can create. Uh, you can sound it out because you know the orthographic rules in English. So, in these kind of things we use the indirect root, we first pronounce the word and from the pronunciation we try to get the meaning. So, part of the word so chocolate means something. So, anti chocolate, so anti is meaning against chocolate meaning chocolate, so anti something that kind of a uh, way we generate meaning and that is called the indirect root. So, in the direct root the written word gives meaning, in the indirect root the written word uh, goes to the spoken form and then the meaning is uh, generated out of it. Now, there, uh, there, uh, the, ex uh, the exclusive models, irregular and familiar words, direct roots, uh, sight reading, less familiar words, indirect root, sounding out is, uh, is true. There are parallel models also, both root processes each word, for example, the horse race kind of a thing. Now, evidence is that the dual root model, they reflect uh, the uh, actual brain's process first came from uh, the clinical data on dyslexia. Now, a condition called acquired dyslexia gives evidences that the two dual root model actually works. And so, what is acquired dyslexia? What it says? Reading impairments due to brain damage in previously skilled readers provides evidences for the dual read model. Now, a condition called acquired dyslexia involves an impairment in uh, reading ability due to brain's damage of a person uh, who has previously been a skilled reader. Depending on the exact location of the brain lesion, different abilities uh, are uh, lost. Patient with something called surface dyslexia have a condition in which the ability to read regularly spelled words and pseudo words are spared while the ability to read irregularly spelled words is actually lost. Now, according to the dual root model, the indirect root is intact, but the direct root has been disrupted by uh, lesion. The opposite pattern also, ha uh, also happens in some forms of dyslexia. Now, patients with something called the phonological dyslexia exhibit a condition in which reading is uh, relatively spared, but the exception that the ability of the sound, uh, sound of unfamiliar word is actually lost. So, basically dyslexia gave, gives us an idea of how the dual root model actually works. Now, patient with surface dyslexia tend to have lesions in the left temporal lobe whereas, uh, word meanings are believed to be stored while those with the phonological dyslexia tend to suffer from damage in the left uh, uh, parietal uh, and the frontal regions which are believed to play a role in uh, recognizing and producing spoken word forms. So, basically then looking at clinical data from dyslexia or the kind of deficiency that have either you have surface dyslexia or you have 
have the phonological dictionaries. Yeah, this basically says that how the dual root model or whether the dual root model is true or not. And so, surface dyslexia can read regular spell words and pseudo words, but not the irregular words. They suggest direct roots are disrupted and damages to the temporal lobe for the ventral what system is disrupted. In phonological dyslexia, so we have looked in the what and the where system in, in, uh, in the previous uh, phonological reading of how the words are spelled and they are stored. So, if you refer there, you will get some idea of what I am talking about. Now, the phonological dyslexia can read familiar words, cannot sound out unfamiliar words. Here, the in, indirect root is disrupted and what happens is the damage to the parietal, uh, the parietal frontal region, the how system is there. And so, we looked at in word processing, the, the dual stream model has something called the what and the how system. If the how system is, uh, is impaired, we have the phonological dyslexia and if we have the what system disrupted, we have something called the surface dyslexia. And this is the how the direct route goes from spelling, orthography to meaning semantics. This is the phonology, this is the semantics and this is the orthography. The direct route is from orthography to semantics and the indirect route is from phonology to semantics and this is how the word processing actually happens. So, one important way in which uh, reading models differ has to do with the question of whether the two roots that we are talking about, they work exclusively uh, with one another or in parallel. Now, according to some accounts, uh, each word is processed through either a direct or an indirect route depending on its characteristics. Specifically, irregular words and highly familiar words go through something called the direct route, uh, which is assumed to be more efficient, while uh, less familiar words, which are assumed to be uh, regular, go through something called the in uh, the indirect route. Now, the last section that we are going to cover today is called text comprehension. So, how do we comprehend text? When you read a passage, uh, you hear your own voice speaking. So, we have something called inner voice. When we read loudly, we produce some inner voice. And in some, in sometimes when we are reading, we do not produce the inner voice. And so, this inner voice that we talk about or the voice, uh, uh, the sounding of uh, words while, while reading is basically an important aspect of understanding text comprehension. Now, we internalize the process of reading aloud as we become more and more proficient speakers. So, what is this inner voice? This inner voice readers read out loud. Now, skilled readers turn their voice inwards, they have sub vocal speech. So, now voice readers who are learning, small children who are just learning, they produce, they read the text uh, 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 through the pronunciation loudly and then they understand. But efficient readers, they do read the word, they pronounce the word, but they do it in a sub vocal uh, form. Now, proficient readers tend to read aloud where even when the text is difficult. So, speech production and perception uh, areas active during silent reading in the skill readers. So, some evidence to support the idea that people rely more on phonological process as the difficulty of the text increase. Novice readers who find all texts as difficult read out loud, but proficient readers tend to read out loud uh, when the text is hard to understand. Neuroimaging data suggests that integrating speech with a written text is an important aspect of becoming a skilled reader. Activity in the left inferior uh, frontal lobe which is an active during speech perception and production is also active during silent reading, but only for skilled readers. Now, there is evidence that this inner uh, voice, they in, uh, involve more than just the pronunciation of individual words, uh, but extends to the prosodic features of speech. So, this inner voice is not only in terms of word, but they also, um, uh, they also extend to uh, the prosody of the speech. So, implicit prosody hypothesis, skilled readers organize what they read into prosodic phases similar to the way they would learn to speak. Now, the imp implicit prosody hypothesis, what it means is, it is the proposal that skilled readers organize the material they read into prosodic phases. So, they do not go by word by word or, uh, uh, or um, phrase by phrase, they uh, read in terms of prosodic features uh, similar to the way they would when they actually speak. So, they, they read in a manner which is similar to they speak and this is the implicit uh, prosodic hypothesis. Now, in speech utterances tend to be organized around prosodic phases lasting 
2 to 3 seconds and this is believed to be associated with short term me memory limitations. ERP component known as the closure po uh, positivity shift is associated with the detection of phase boundaries in speech and is believed to reflect the process of memory storage and redirection of attention. So, closure pro positivity shifts or the ERP component is associated with detection of phase boundaries in speech and they also uh, elicit the phase boundaries in actually reading. So, reading and comprehension text is a dynamic process which is built on cycles of memory retrieval and memory storage. Now, as each word is read, its meaning and all related concepts are retrieved from memory. This information is somehow integrated with the current context and with previous information to construct a situational model of the text which then must be stored in long term memory. So, this is how it happens a memory retrieval versus memory storage system works and this creates a situational model which lets us to uh, understand the text. Rather than waiting until the end, of the end of the text, the reader builds up a situational model in an increment fashion. So, we, this process happens in an increment fashion, presumably phrase by phrase. Now, if you are interrupted halfway through your story, you can still tell what you have read up to that point and this says that the reading happens in a phrase by phrase manner or in a situational up updating model. Now, in, uh, it appears that processing written discourse is much more like processing spoken narrative. So, this should put an end to uh, today's lecture. What we tend, uh, what we try to do in today's lecture is we looked at how written text is processed, we looked at the various characteristics of written language, we looked at three different forms of written language and the processing of these written language. Further to that, we also looked at how uh, reading happens, what are the uh, various ways in which reading happens, the dual model feature of reading and we also looked at th how text is uh, uh, comprehended. When we meet next, we will look into uh, some development features of this text perception um, and reading skills in children and we will summarize of what we have done in terms of reading and writing abilities uh, in, uh, uh, in human language and uh, focusing on to these reading and writing abilities. We will highlight how these reading and writing abilities uh, actually help us in, uh, in, in developing the language or in uh, terms of understanding and comprehending and exchanging ideas through human language system. But till we do that in the next lecture, it is thank you and goodbye from here.